Welcome to this show discussing problems and issues of health with Dr. Alsena. For this segment of this show, I'm going to continue to talk about diseases of the pancreas. When I left off last week, I was having a discussion about acute pancreatitis. I want to say a few more words about it before I continue to talk about chronic pancreatitis, which is basically what I'm going to do in this segment. Now, this is uh, the pancreas right here, and this is another example of it. When the pancreas becomes inflamed because of a variety of different reasons, and last week I was specifically talking about goldstone that will come from the gallbladder that will block the, the passage of pancreatic juice to the, uh, to the stomach, as it were, and then that, then the juice then back up. The juice I'm talking about really is the enzyme. That's the proper word. Backs up on the pancreas, causing the pancreas to become inflamed. You have acute pancreatitis that way. Specifically talking about the gallstone. Other things that can cause the same process to occur would be like a parasite, like like uh, ascaris, another uh, parasite like Chinese fluke. Anything that can cause an obstruction of these different tubes can cause that. Of course, parasites can find their way in there as well. So those are the three things that can block the, the, the passage of, uh, of this uh, 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 enzyme that is produced by the exocrine part of the pancreas. The pancreas has two main parts to it, the endocrine parts that produce three separate uh, uh, hormones, insulin being one of them and then the exocrine part that produces a series of uh, enzymes that are needed to be dumped into the stomach via the, uh, coming from the pancreas into the, into the stomach uh, to help us to digest food. Okay, now the pancreas can also, in addition to being inflamed, can also become infected. That's the part that I did mention about last week. By the way, the pain in the stomach that I'm talking about will be on the left side of the abdomen, which is where the left upper part of the abdomen is where the pancreas is located, okay? So that's where we will concentrate on. The person will have the most pain. We will properly examine the abdomen. But then, empirically, we are going to treat the patient in addition to the fluid that I mentioned and, and that we have to replace because the pancreas produces a tremendous amount of secretion that causes the person to become dehydrated by losing a tremendous amount of fluid. So you have to replace the fluid aggressively, in particular using fluid that contains sugar and uh, in it so that the person really can get something that, that, is, that is nutritious rather than just normal saline, which is just salt and water. Then you would empirically treat the patient with uh, <clears throat> An antibi antibiotic intravenously because uh, the patient is, has to be kept NPO, mean no food by mouth, and then you will give the patient empirically mean that because we're talking about the GI tract, we will use medication that can cover antibiotics such as the anaerobes. Well, all the anaerobes uh, that are having to do with the GI tract will respond to Zosin, for instance. So you give the patient Zosin, and since you're not sure what else you're dealing with, it's always good to also put vancomycin on board as well. So the combination of zosin intravenously every six hours with uh, uh, vancomycin either every 24 hours or twice a day depending on the patient kidney function would be the right way to go. I left these things out last week or hadn't com finished saying them. So basically another thing that you have to be on the lookout for, these patients can develop what we call ARDS. ARDS which means that the substance that's needed to keep the lung nice and moist can be destroyed by the, by the acuteness of the disease and the patient develop acute uh, uh, pulmonary failure by going into ARDS. So you got to be on the lookout for that. This is why these patients are best treated in the intensive care unit and then you're always on the lookout by doing the blood gas. Uh, you do the chest x-ray, the CAT scan, you're doing the blood gas, you'll be very certain that this patient lungs can in fact function properly because ARDS is a lethal disease. Can patient can die from that. So those are the points I wanted to finish up on acute uh, pancreatitis. And of course, you eventually will taper off the, uh, the, the IV fluid and try the patient on, on clear liquid diet first. And you try to stay away from things that has too much fat in them because the more fat 
you give the person, the more you're going to stress not only the gallbladder, but also the pancreas to try to secrete the substances that are necessary to digest the fat. So you, you go on a low-fat diet, you start with clear liquid, then, 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 then the soft diet, and then regular diet very slowly, and then you give the patient anti-nausea medication exercise, Zofran, composite, stuff like that. And then if the patient needs pain medication, I told you before, you provide them with ample pain medication. And most important of all, if it is alcohol that's causing the problem, while you're treating the patient acutely for the pancreatitis, you must also be careful that this patient doesn't go into alcohol withdrawal. Because from 48 to 72 hours after the patient stopped drinking, they are at risk to go into alcohol withdrawal. And I explained before the so-called alcoholic cocktail that we provide patients with, which is basically Ativan, uh, thymine, uh, glucose, uh, and so on, and folic acid. So it's basically thymine. You must always, let me repeat, you must always give the thymine first. Because if you don't give the thymine first and you give glucose, the glucose is going to acutely deplete. The, if you go back, remember your biochemistry in medical school, there's, there's a system called the Krebs cycle. Well, thymine is, is an important integral part of that. So as soon as you give sugar, you need timing in order to properly metabolize the sugar. Well, if you don't have enough timing uh, in the Krebs cycle to deliver to the sugar you just inject, injected into the patient, the patient will de likely develop acute wanaki encephalopathy, uh, which is a disaster. You don't want that. So it's best to administer the timing, and then you follow the timing with glucose as part of the treatment that you're providing for patient intravenously and then you give the patient one milligram of folic acid intravenously and then this particular patient also also you must check the phosphorus level because the people who drink a lot of alcohol urinate out a lot of phosphorus and then low phosphorus can cause seizures I'm, I'm telling you all these things because this is what I do this is teaching this is medical school teaching I know this is a medical school classroom but this show is watched all over the world and different people at different level of experience watch it when the patient shows up with an alcoholic you're treating them for acute pancreatitis which is fine you make a great diagnosis but you must also remember to check the phosphorus you must also remember to pay attention to the fact that they stopped drinking 48 to 72 hours before uh, since this, they show up and they're likely to go into alcohol withdrawal. You may be solving one problem very nicely, you can't forget the other problem. So the alcoholic cocktail, again, I describe them in many of my books that I have chapters on alcoholism and then I describe these things fully. You can get copies of my books anywhere you can find them so that you could read these things, how it ought to be done. Okay, enough say about acute pancreatitis. Now, chronic pancreatitis is a major, major problem, major medical problem. That is because of the recurrent nature of the repeated attack to the pancreas acutely to cause the inflammation, okay? And the patient wind up having the body of the pancreas, the tissue of the pancreas being really compromised and destroyed very slowly. And the pancreas is now sick, not acutely, but chronically. And once that happens, you really cannot replace the pancreatic tissue. It's chronically destroyed because of whatever the, 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 the thing that's causing it to be sick in the first place. Okay? You start with inflammation, the inflammation becomes chronic, and then you have chronic pancreatitis. So the symptoms, and again, everything that can cause acute pancreatitis can go on to cause chronic pancreatitis, and I don't have to go over the list for you again. The list is quite long, okay? Now, prominent of course is alcohol and gallstone, which is 80% of acute pancreatitis is due to alcohol abuse, and 20% thereabout is due to gallstone. So you have the, the, two, the two most frequent causes. Now, the pancreatic uh, chronicity causes the patient to have pain, chronic pain in the left upper part of the abdomen, the patient has constant nausea, uh, vomiting, and the patient is likely to have what's called steatorrhea. Steatorrhea is the fact that the patient is passing fatty, greasy stool all the time, and I'll explain to you why that is. And the patient is likely to develop malabsorption, which is a major, major problem, and I'll go into that in detail. The patient is likely to develop diabetes mellitus type 2, 
Why? Because the pancreas is now chronically sick. Both the exocrine part of it as well as the endocrine part of it are now damaged permanently. And when that happens, then of course insulin cannot be produced and the blood sugar goes up and the patient now has, you have a diabetic patient in your hand to deal with. Weight loss is a major problem. Weakness, tiredness, headache, dizziness. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the malabsorption part, which is really one of the worst things that can happen to someone who suffers from chronic pancreatitis. Okay, let's go. The pancreas secrete these substances we call enzyme, the exocrine part of the pancreas. They are needed to be dumped into the stomach for us to digest our food. Once that is compromised, then when we eat this food, we cannot digest them. We cannot digest them, the person becomes malnourished, obviously, he or she loses weight, and then the state of malabsorption sets in. Okay. There are certain key vitamins, such as vitamin B12, folic acid, vitamin D, iron. And let me take a little time to show you how crucial that is. Vitamin folic acid, uh, B12 is absorbed in the terminal ileum. So there's malabsorption. That area is sick. You cannot absorb the B12. Folic acid is absorbed in the jejunum. Okay, so when you have chronic pancreatitis, the part of the jejunum is all swollen and sick and cannot absorb the folic acid. The duodenum part of the stomach cannot absorb iron, so therefore you develop iron deficiency, anemia. Okay, but I mean D cannot be absorbed either because you don't have the necessary enzyme that it to finish the process of digestion once you eat this thing or swallow them for them to be absorbed. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Well, it, of all the bad things that chronic pancreatitis can do and does do to people, I'm going to raise the level of discussion to a completely higher academic level to give you an idea how interesting and complicated clinical medicine really is. Let's take the example of folic acid. By virtue of the fact that somebody abuses alcohol, all alcoholics, everyone who abuses alcohol, by definition, has relative folate deficiency, period. You say, well, how come? Well, first of all, most of these folks are not eating things that have sufficient folic acid in them, on the one hand. On the other hand, even if they were eating things that have sufficient folic acid in it, alcohol itself is known to poison the so-called folate pathway. There's a folic pathway. Alcohol poisoned that. I'm not going to go into the detail for you, but that's the fact. So therefore, if you're an alcoholic, by definition, you have folic acid deficiency. You say, well, what's the big deal? Well, folic acid deficiency can cause anemia macrocytic anemia. If that wasn't bad enough, that is the least of it. The worst of it is that the folic acid, when it is deficient, causes elevation of homocysteine. Elevated homocysteine is a major medical problem. It's a thrombophilia that causes people to clot. You can clot anywhere. Let me repeat that. You already have problem with the folic acid because it's being poisoned by the alcohol itself. That's a direct damage, poison to the pathway. They're not eating enough folic acid containing food. And now that the folic acid can also cause them to become anemic, okay? Megaloblastic anemia, macrocytic anemia, which is large red blood cells because you need folic acid in order for the process of development of red blood cell to properly take in place of the RNA cannot proceed in its pathway because of it is a block because of the lack of folic acid. So the 
the, 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 the development process stops right there. So the white blood cell becomes very immature and large and causes macrocytic anemia, large red blood cell anemia, okay? But then once the homocysteine is elevated, there are many, many conditions that can cause somebody's homocysteine to become elevated. Folic acid happens to be one of them. Well, once it is elevated, the patient already has all this problem with his or her pancreas, with all the other stuff that we have to deal with without be getting into with you because I'm in no hurry and there has to be one, more than one show, if not more than two shows about chronic pancreatitis because it's such a serious medical problem. Then you're going to have the propensity to clot. And the clotting can occur spontaneously anywhere in the body, in the legs, in the lung, in the brain, around the coronary arteries, etc. It, it can happen depending on the circumstances of where the person is. The person lying in bed in the hospital. As the person has a trauma, is the person traveling more than eight, 12 hours by plane to go somewhere, you can clot, okay? All right, so that's one problem that folic acid can cause, okay? The next vitamin that chronic pancreatitis can cause a deficient in, of course, is B12, B12 deficiency, for the same reason. There are many causes of B12 deficiency, but the one that I'm about to discuss, of course, is the fact that the person cannot absorb the B12 because the B12 is absorbed in the terminal ileum. Even if you were to eat the B12 by way of chewing your food or swallow the B12 by way of a drink or a tablet or whatever, a capsule, ain't going anywhere because you can't absorb it. You don't have the pancreatic exocrine enzyme being dumped into the by the, see the ampulla of water is the, is, is the little tube that carries the, the stuff from here through the, into the stomach, okay? Okay, you, you don't have that going for you. So therefore you cannot absorb B12. You say, well, what is the big deal? It is a huge deal. The huge deal because B12 is needed for every cell that grow in the human body, B12 is necessary for that cell to continue to grow doesn't matter, from the skin to the hair follicle, it really doesn't matter, period. And one of the worst things that can happen to someone is to be B12 deficient, clinically speaking. Okay, now, once you cannot absorb the B12, a series of things will happen, okay? Again, the homocysteine will go up as well, which predisposing you to clotting. That is the least of it as it relates to B12. Because once your B12 is low, you have chronic, you have to understand the magnitude of what I'm telling you. You have people have chronic pancreatitis. They're running from here to there. Some of them are very poor, minority folks, etc., who have no money. They have no insurance. They go from emergency room to emergency room, from clinic to clinic. You know, people are gonna think about these things that I'm explaining to you, which is really the chronic pancreatitis, yeah, they'll try to address what they can with that, and I'll, when I get to treatment, I'll tell you. But you have to understand the level of which I'm explaining this to you, so that because of the malabsorption, you can't absorb B12. So you're gonna have B12 deficiency. You say, well, what's the big deal? It is a huge deal. B12 deficiency causes dementia. Many, many, many hundred millions of folks you see, elderly folks who are in the nursing home and other places throughout the world, throughout this country, are there. People think they have Alzheimer's disease. Well, m many of them, the majority of them, don't have Alzheimer's disease. What they have is that they have B12 deficiency that was not picked up clinically, and they wind up having two reasons. Number one, as one gets older, one does not produce sufficient acid in the stomach so that B12 can be properly absorbed because of the aging process. This is called atrophic gastritis. All of us, myself included, I'm getting older, all, the, all of us. So you have to pay attention to that. In addition to that, to break down the decomplexing of B12 that one eats begins in the mouth. That's correct, via the salivary gland, secretes enzyme 
whose job it is to begin the decomplexing of B12. You have never heard this before. Now you are hearing it, okay? And as we get older, all of us, we develop a deficiency in salivary gland secretion. That's it. So therefore, the problem begins in the mouth because of the lack of saliv proper amount of salivary gland to begin the decomplexing process. When the vitamin B12 does get into the stomach, right here, this is the stomach, the acidity of the stomach is compromised by virtue of our aging process, and therefore B12 cannot be absorbed properly because to absorb B12, we need an acidic milieu. You don't have enough. So all you have to do is be an elderly individual, you wind up with atrophic gastritis. And if your B12 level, any one B12 level, is allowed to remain low for more than five years, the damages are not reversible. There you have it. So you have all these folks in a nursing home or at home or wherever, adult or wherever, or at home having difficulty with the mentation, and people jump onto the bank wagon while they have Alzheimer's. They don't. They have dementia, secondary to B12 deficiency, and or in addition to the B12 deficiency, some of these people have microvascular disease of the brain because of high blood pressure that either was never treated or not treated properly. Let me explain this. One or every two black adults is hypertensive. One out of two. One out of every three American adults suffers from hypertension. Now I'm here to tell you of the number that I gave you, has it related to hypertension? Only the bare minority are seeking, are getting care, and those that are getting care, maybe somewhere between 25, 30 percent of them are getting their blood pressures treated properly. And all the time that the blood pressure is not being treated properly, micro strokes are taking place into the brain. So that's called microvascular disease of the brain, and these people wind up eventually not being able to think properly because they have. So I want you to imagine there are five million folks in this country with Alzheimer's. Okay, there's some 50, 46 million somewhere worldwide. I think I just wrote that in a book that I'm doing right now. I want you to understand how many of these you have roughly. 50 million Latino folks in this country, somewhere about 46 million black folks. I'm here to tell you, the vast majority of them are getting nonsense for medical care. Even those who do go are getting lousy medical care. Lousy medical care. And this is a statement of fact, lousy medical care. So all these people's brain are constantly being attacked by the elevated blood pressure by the poorly treated diabetes, by the poorly treated cholesterol. And on top of that, they develop chronic pancreatitis. Now they can't absorb B12. What chance do they have to, to live a healthy life? Zero. That's it, zero. And who's doing anything about it? No one, period. No one, you got few highly motivated, devoted physician across this country who's really taken the time that is necessary to provide quality care for these people because they have no money to pay and you have to provide for them. That is why I have committed my career to taking care of the working poor. My career, I've been offered all sorts of jobs I can't say because of the color of my skin I was not offered chairmanship of medicine. That would be wrong. I can't say I was not offered deanship. That would be wrong as well. Turn all of them down. Wanted to sit in my little office, do what I can for those that I agree to take care of. And I've had a successful career doing it. I'm not a business person. I'm, I was, I'm not in this for money. I've never dealt with money. I wouldn't know what to do with it other than buying a suit and a car, a nice house, blah, 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 blah. That's the rest of it. So I'm here telling you the truth that these people now have, because of issues involving stress and depression, genetics or whatever, they abuse alcohol, 
all ethnic groups are abuse alcohol, not just minorities. As a matter of fact, if you look at the government statistics, more white folks abuse alcohol than black folks, even though you would think the other is, is that happens to be the correct fact. More white folks abuse alcohol than black folks. That's the, that's the real, true, honest the statistics. Okay, so, therefore, then you can absorb B12. So low B12 not only causes dementia, it could also cause seizures. It could paralyze you because the, all the nerve cells in the body are covered with a myelin sheet. And that sheet requires B12 for it to remain in good shape. Once your B12 is low, the sheet that covers all the nerves with the my myelin sheet begins to degenerate. So therefore, all the nerves in the brain, all the way down your spine, you just, wherever the nerves are, are being damaged because of like a B12, okay? And the anemia part, what people don't understand, even in the medical school and whatever, people talk about the anemia, B12 induced anemia. Of course, B12 can cause the anemia, but guess what? You got 5,000 micrograms of B12 in the adult body, okay? It takes 10 years to deplete that. But as the B12 curve start going down, the, the level going down, all these symptoms set in. The very last place is when the anemia is going to occur. So if you're looking for the anemia to diagnose B12 deficiency, you're missing the point and you're missing the boat. It ain't going to happen unless the patient has pernicious anemia, which is 18, 19, 20-year-old woman and men, but it's more common in women than men. That's a different syndrome of B12, okay? Other than that, there are more people with B12 by far that are not anemic than people who are anemic because of it. So you have to understand clinical medicine, evaluate these people B12 level proactively so that you could prevent all this devastation that's taking place. Listen, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to continue the discussion next week. Until such time, keep watching the show. This is Dr. Alcina saying so long and bye-bye.